That's great. Brody, That's you great. refuse to age. It's fantastic to see. <laughs> Very kind of you. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, come on, we've got the biggest name in, well, the two biggest names in sports. Uh, and, and one of the biggest names in rugby. And one of the biggest names in rugby here. Um, Brody, come one on. Of, one of Clapham's biggest influences. One of Clapham's biggest influences. Yeah. You boys are down in isolation in Australia, uh, imprisoned in your tiny little rooms. How frustrating has it been? How, how have you stayed entertained? Because I can't imagine Popey's keeping you up, you know, with the laughs. Is Popey okay with, without his dog? I, I really worry about him. He's been on this podcast and I, um, I, I'm starting to think he must be missing his dog a lot. He posts a lot about it. Yeah, well, it's actually nice to not see Ollie Pope's Instagram full of dog pictures. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but that makes a change. But um, we've had a, yeah, it's been an interesting quarantine period for us. We had, um, we had three days of hard quarantine where we weren't allowed to leave our bedrooms. Um, but then after that, we were allowed to train, um, see each other, um, but still under some very... Um, uh, I say this lightly, some very strange rules, but, um, you know, we've had to do what we needed to do to get through it. But come Saturday, I think we are, we're pretty free birds, sure, aren't we? We are. We're free from Saturday, I think. We're not sure exactly when on Saturday, but yeah, it's, um, it's been okay, to be honest. I think the most frustrating thing for me of quarantine is rooming next to Stokesy when he falls asleep at like random times. His TV goes into like, this sleep mode with <laughs> the most annoying alarm like sound you've ever heard. And the, when the bloke's asleep, you ain't waking him. And <laughs> then next door, all I can hear is this TV going like ding dong ding ding. <laughs> da, 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 da. What is he watching? <laughs> I, I, right, I, I'll give you. I, I'll, I I'll think give I'd you actually do. I think I'd actually do pretty well in quarantine. I, it sounds a lot like boarding school. Uh, and it sounds <laughs> it sounds like Saturday is X yet weekend for you guys, and you'll be uh, going out and enjoying yourself. I, I think I'd absolutely love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think uh, come Saturday we won't be able to go out and and, and and you know do what Saturday nights are for. But um, it would be nice to to have a bit of freedom back and, and and get out and see anything but just our cricket stadium and our bedrooms. Well, you guys have gone into business together with Joffa and Turnsey, you know the master fixer. Um, to form forecast. Tell Tur Turns is a bloody good nickname. What, what's his real name? Uh, his name's Mike Turns. Uh, nice. Yeah. Just put a Y in the end. Yeah. That's cracking. Thanks <laughs> 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 for um, everyone, isn't it? Stokesy Broadie. Yeah, Stokesy Broadie. <laughs> um, I, I actually was going to call you Broad O, but yeah, an O or a Y is fine. Well, guys, tell us how That's forecast. That's a bit Aussie, isn't it? Aussie. Yeah, you go it Aussie, is, you it go is a bit Aussie, yeah. yeah. But there's quite a, you know, I'm, I'm the CEO of Clapham and there's uh, quite a lot of Australians in, in Clapham. So our banter has sort of been mixed over the years and Australian twang has sort of come in to a lot of our chats. You know, some guys actually go for a few schooners out here. Um, but yeah, no, 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 ca carry on. No, but oh, or why? I'll call you Broadie if you, if you prefer. Or Stuart, I don't mind. Um, Not Stuart, that's, that's safe for when my mum tells me off. Okay, no worries. Well, no worries. guys, tell us how Forecast came about. Is it just cricketers getting involved in Forecast? What other athletes are involved in this wonderful business of yours? <sighs> So I'll take you back to the very start where the first lockdown happened and that's really when sort of Call of Duty and gaming went to a new level with, you know, the, the guys in the cricket team, especially, you know, there was a, there was a, a level of it being played before between us all where, you know, we would play jump online on the evenings and stuff like that before games and training, but then Obviously, once lockdown hit, it was, you know, there was not a lot to do really when you're confined to your house. So we actually found ourselves playing and like ended up getting into a routine and messaging each other saying, right, let's fly into the dance together. And and we actually found that that was a way to genuinely keep in contact with each other whilst everything was, you know, happening with COVID. And then Turnsy kept on actually telling me a few times, he's like, oh, Stalksy, you should like, you should start streaming, you know, like have you... Yeah, have you ever thought about it? And I was like, oh, nah, man, like, just, just going to do it for the crack. Like, just enjoy playing COD for what it is. But then I sort of gave in to after about three or four times of him kept on saying it to me. And I was like, right, OK, let's, like, do it. And then did a few streams. And actually, we got a few viewers in because, obviously, that's what was really kicking off at the time was eSports. And then we went from, you know, like, streaming to then, like, sort of, 
almost giving you know like Brody about a pitch about you know sort of going into business um all around online streaming but you know I could sit here for three hours and tell you the whole thing but I'm not going to do that but then fast forward a lot we've ended up turning it into what we're calling sort of like um an athlete-led media organization where we've got um you know we've got quite a few different sort of branches out of the business you know like gaming being one investments being the other bringing on um our own sort of professional esports gamers and especially in the call of duty world and yeah we've, we've basically just based it around that and we've got a we've got a big team behind us now so it's, St- it's gone stokesy yeah. are you are you looking to branch out into instagram stars like influencers um is that is that an area you'd be looking at well, I mean, you know, I can't, I can't disclose any names outside of myself, Mike, well, Joffre, and, and Stuart at the moment. But um, you never know; you might see someone in the not too near future who I'm, might be in that. Okay. I, I'm not signing up yet. They haven't approached me yet. Oh, right, okay. Uh, but, but I'm sure after this call, we can we can discuss business. There's probably you know, yeah. some business to be done. I mean, it's interesting. You went into gaming in lockdown. For me. It was about Bitcoin and built on. Those are two markets I, I attacked quite heavily, invested in, and done exceedingly well. So, if you need any tips on both those <laughs> markets, uh, they're both on the up. Although the built on market has taken a slight slump, uh, but uh, you know that's the time to invest. Really, it will be picking up come summer. Well, Brody, talk, talking business, I'm sure you've heard from your business partner and best mate Guernsey, uh, Harry Gurney. Um, about our beer, more lash. What's going on with yeah. the ordering system? G- Gurney, I've sent him a number of voice notes and then the guy's gone cold, cold on me. I mean, the guy hasn't even got 10,000 followers on Instagram. <laughs> I'm coming to him <laughs> with a fantastic offering of more lash, a beer that is unscientifically proven to improve your chat. And he was interested and then Brody's just gone cold on me. I don't know what's going on. I don't want to have to go up to Nottingham. I really don't want to. It's not an area I particularly want to go to, but I will <laughs> if I have to. Well, look, you can say that one half of the cat and wickets is more than happy to stock your beer. Yeah, but okay. But I'd say I'm probably only 49% of the uh, the decision-making. So you've got to, you know, now he's retired, he's, he's really taken control. And, you know, right. you obviously haven't offered him a good enough price because that's what it will come down to. When, when, when Duckett came on this show, he was talking about him. I'm just going to say, wait, where is he? Harry Gurney. Here he is. <laughs> Hold on, two seconds. Gunners, it's the magician here. I hope this finds you well and your Q4 is progressing positively. Listen, I'm, I'm here with Brodo and Stokesy and um, we're just talking about more lash and, and Brodo uh, or Brody, wherever where you want to describe it, um, says that he's keen for more lash, but you're holding up the deal. So can you just fucking sort it out? <laughs> Love a <and> champagne. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stokesy, you are, live you, up- are you cans? Are you cans only? So- no, no, no. We're kegs. We're kegs. It's very important, uh, Brody. Just say that a percentage of the keg goes to Restart Rugby, a fantastic, phenomenal uh, organisation that helps rugby players. Uh, but obviously, a lot of it goes in my pocket as well. Um, <laughs> Stokesy, Stokesy, you live up in Durham, which is a beautiful part of the world. Durham's Archie's uh, second favourite university town. Yeah. For nights out, do you ever frequent Clute in the early hours, or are you more on a, more of a sort of a Newcastle man? Well, no, I'm 30 now, so you know. Well, that's that's nothing. No, that's old. That's um, three day hangover Careful. territory. That. Okay. Yeah, I. Uh, I it's it's interesting. I don't know how much time you spend in Durham, but you don't know a guy called Robert Sancroft Baker. Uh, he was quite a big deal up in the in the campus there. Uh, his dad was quite high up in Coots and bloody good rower, actually. I don't know if you're into rowing. Did you ever come across him? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't, know. Mate, definitely worth connecting with that guy on LinkedIn. Well, It'd well, be helpful, especially well, with the esports stuff. We're talking about a big guy up in, uh, in Durham. They don't come bigger than Collingwood. And when we had Duckett on the pod, he confirmed that Collingwood was a loose character at the best of times. I'm guessing you've all seen those photos of him in full white today, student okay. house party. Um, what's the best night out you lads have had with him? He's still refusing to leave the England setup, even though he is about 50. Photos of him in whites in a student bar. I don't yeah, know. You've not seen those. Mate, we'll oh, get those. Not in a student bar, at a student house party. In a studi- ha- at a student house party. It's, it's going around. It's doing, it's doing the turns. What, with like Collingwood number five on the back? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Not and also he's breath. got someone holding an arrow saying this is Paul Collingwood <laughs> right next to him. <laughs> <laughs> but is, is, is Collingwood good, good fun on a, on a night out? 
So Collie is great fun. He's, um, you know, like, as you say, he's, he's nearly 60 now. And um, <laughs> he's, he's still living like a 23-year-old. Um, but I've got to give him so much credit. He brings a lot of energy. And the one thing that he will never, ever, ever fall over to is anything but beer. Okay. He will not drink anything else but beer. And the amount of times I've tried to persuade him to try a Jaeger bomb, to try this, to try that. He's just so stubborn and all he does is just sit there and drink beer. So Maybe we should send um, a text. We should. Oh, he would love it. He would love your beer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, but has he got a blue tick? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Send him, send him, send him. Um, <laughs> to, 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 talking about Duckett, though, you know, he used to be loose as hell, used to put on a lot of weight in pre -C. He couldn't help himself. People were shedding pounds. He was putting on the weight. Um, I've never seen someone get so many preseason suspensions as Duckett as well for hitting the beers, but that's by the by. He's almost sort of Freddie Flintoff-esque with his, uh, you know, charisma and his love for, for booze. Talking about Flintoff, Stokesy, it must really fuck you off when people compare you with him because you've got a way better record in all departments than Mr. Freddie Flintoff. Are you ever tempted to, you know, say to the reporters, guys, wait a second, I'm far superior to Mr. Flintoff? Uh, no, I mean, being a... Being an all-rounder and being someone who's not overly driven by stats is, uh, uh, you know, reason why it sort of like doesn't bother me. You know, those kind of stuff. You know, I'm a um, Stuart's very similar. Where stats at the end of the day are not Stuart really. Stuart loves of what his offers. stats. Stuart well, loves yeah. his stats. There's never, he's, there's he's, never been a man like, so livid when he hit for a four than Stuart Broad. He like he enjoys <laughs> information broadly. I think information and stats are a bit different, but. Um, yeah, stats only tell half the story, you know, that's, that's, that's always a big thing. That's always one thing I live by. Guys, I'm, I'm going to well, sort of say, well, say, well, say here. Well, Craig, I just want to say, on, yeah, go I want to say on, on the Stokesy, um, both, um, like flint off comparisons that you get, I actually don't think a lot of the time they're compared uh, as cricketers. I think it's very hard to compare different era of, of cricketers. What they're compared on is their like charisma and how they lead a team. You like, look at Freddie, whether his stats were fantastic, what Freddie did when he got three lions on, on his chest is he drove the team forward. And I think Beefy, when my dad played with Beefy, he was very, very similar. Beefy would grab the game by the scruff of the neck and go. And actually, with all-rounders, you know, unless you're Jack Callis, your stats are always, you, you're there to change momentums of games. You're not there to have great stats. And um, I think comparisons come because these guys... Have got the ability to change a game like that, and that's why we love watching them, and that's yeah. why teammates love playing them. That's why a lot of people compare me to a mixture of Marcus Smith and Danny Cipriani. You know, I've got the charisma right. off the field as Cipriani. Um, By the way, that'd be the... some rugby player. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know how much you know, Brody, but I'm a captain of the Clapham Falcons. We're a semi-professional rugby outfit here in Clapham. We absolutely dominate the nights out. Uh, Popey knows knows me well. I sometimes see him out running about. Uh, but yeah, people have described me as like, well, Marcus Smith is the younger version of me, but I've, I've just got a lot more chat because I'm a semi pro, but I work in the city. I have a six figure salary and, uh, yeah. And they, you know, I also have the title of chief chat officer, um, <laughs> and also the mayor of Clapham and I've got over 20,000 connections on LinkedIn. Anyway, look, it's not about me. It's about you no, guys. No, it's not. It's, it's about, about these guys. guys. Brody, you're based up in Nottingham, which is a beautiful town. Fantastic for its cricket and other things, especially your, your, your love of footy. Um, but. I know Molly, who is now your wonderful fiance, wife, whatever she may be. Um, she's, she's originally from Wandsworth. She's from Wandsworth. She's from Clapham. She's from these parts. So, do you guys still live down here? Do you frequent the city? She, I, I'm Nottingham through and through. Always will be born there. Um, you know, always love being from Nottingham. Molly's a yeah, southwest, south of the river, lady. Um, so we we spend a lot of our time in like the Wimbledon type sort of area but also a lot of our time up in Nottingham as well you know I've, I've convinced her that Nottingham you know she got a bit nervous going north of Watford Gap to start with but then once she got to Nottingham she was like wow yeah this is actually you know there is somewhere outside of London um, and now she's a Nottingham Forest fan um, well I tell her she's not a Forest fan um, and uh, yeah she she loves it up there but yeah we, we split our time between Nottingham and the southwest of uh, London and, and more importantly have you ever had a Megan's a few. Oh, yeah, they a do few. the most delicious avocado. Stokesy, if you're ever up in town, let me know. I'd love to take you for some avocado there. It's brilliant. 
What's the Megan's? Oh, the it's room. this fantastic place where you can get, you know, a, a, an array of brunches. You know, from poached eggs on avocado and toast to you can have a halloumi. You can have, you know, your proteins. It's beautiful. And well, that's me. That. A bit of yeah, eggs yeah. benedict with the side of halloumi, mate. Top yeah. Uh, well, and, what are these things predict to the minute, Stokes? The acai bowls or something? Acai bowls. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, there yeah, you yeah. that. That's what I normally have one of those after CrossFit. Yeah, they're really good. They're bloody good, actually. <laughs> um, Stokesy, growing up in New Zealand, your father, Jed, was a rugby league, le- le- rugby league legend and playing for New Zealand and then having an amazing coaching career. Your father was hard as nails. You know, he once had a finger amputated just to be able to carry on playing the game. For a man, you know, as Bill, and uh, with such incredible coordination as yourself, was he absolutely appalled that you were fucking around having afternoon teas, running around in crisp whites, rather than pursuing his love of rugby league? <laughs> Um, I played a lot. I played a lot of rugby league and rugby as well as cricket when I was younger. Um, but he loved he loved rugby and he loved cricket as well. He was he wasn't very good at cricket. My mum was a cricketer, even though he never liked me to tell him that. But um, <laughs> no, nah, he he was very supportive. You know, I think I had to make a decision when I was about thirteen, fourteen about which one I wanted to progress on. And obviously, being you know younger then. It was actually uh, sort of, I was a bit nervous to go and speak to my dad to say, like, look, I'm, I'm going to pack rugby in and, and concentrate on playing cricket. But he didn't bat an eyelid. Um, you know, obviously, I was very lucky to, to grow up with two parents who literally would drop anything at a hat to, to take me where I needed to be, to provide me with the equipment that I needed before I was lucky enough to come into, you know, sponsorships and stuff like that. So I'm not, I look back on that and you know, I've got no idea why I was nervous in telling him because, um, yeah, you know, that's what. You know, parents are for they're there to support you and, and, and help you with all your decisions yeah. up until a certain yeah. age. Well, on the other side of the coin, we've got Oakham educated Stuart Broad, who was in the same year as Tom Croft. Uh, were you mates with Crofty at school? I was, yeah. Crofty, um, Matt Smith, who played for the Tigers for a long time. I think he's Smithy. coach was there now, yeah. So, um, yeah, Crofty was a great lad. Yeah, he uh, he played on to play for the British Lions and, and England rugby and, you know, they like a really successful career, didn't he? He is absolutely fantastic. And Broad, you also grew up the son of a professional sportsman, your father, Chris, an incredible batsman in the game. Uh, did you feel extra pressure, uh, pressure when you were, you know, going around the public school circuits? Did you get a bit of jip? Did you, you know, get, get some insults from the players saying you're only here on uh, sort of the, the merit of your surname? <laughs> um, probably. I, actually, I, I think I, I came to Australia uh, when I left school for like a gap year, so to speak, to play cricket. And that was an eye-opening experience. You know, my dad did well in Australia and um, I think the Australians were very keen to remind me as an 18-year-old that I, I was only playing cricket because of my surname. Um, but that, that, you know, that turned me from being a schoolboy into, right, okay, I need to, you know, I need, I need to grow up to play, to play this game because it's pretty tough on the field. It was a great experience for me. Um, but yeah, I think there's always pressure, isn't there, from, you know, from having parents who have been successful in their own right but I was very fortunate with the way my my parents um treated me you know it was all about enjoyment it was never why did you drop that catch why did you not score runs it was have you first question have you had fun I think if you can keep that mindset from school from school level all the way to international level if you can judge yourself on whether you're enjoying it and having fun then you're going to improve much quicker anyway yeah Yeah, I mean very similar to me actually uh my My well, um, you know, my, I've always sort of my father's a very successful businessman, and you know, I just always wanted to you know, follow in his footsteps. And I remember when I went to my gap year in Canary Wharf, and uh, I know he was mightily uh, like proud of me when I did that. And I, when he was on his third marriage, you know, he he just said to me, you know, he didn't say he didn't say well, I was having fun. He just said, "How what's your basic?" And I told him, you know, it was you know seventy k, and it, the he was disappointed. He said, stop having fun. You know, you'll have fun when you make money. And now I've made money. I am having a lot of fun spraying that coin around. Yeah, it's still incredibly lonely though. Aren't you? Infernos, I, I get like a bottle of champagne and just like, yeah, people <laughs> fucking love it. Um, Stokesy, you lit the world alight with your tongue in the 2013 Ashes when you were the, you sort of one of the only uh, batsmen who stood up strong against that Billy Mitchell Johnson. I love the way that you bring it back to a very serious podcast. It's a great balance. Thank you so much. Um, was that the most poisonous environment you boys have ever played cricket in? I mean, what was the kind of chat going out on the field that day? Just give us a tiny bit of, you know, little pockets of the sledging which the Aussies were giving you. Uh, I mean, I, I was, yeah, that was my first tour, um, you know, overseas in the England team. And, 
you know, it was obviously an Ashes in Australia, so it was a big, 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 big series to sort of see what international cricket's like. And to be honest, I wouldn't change anything the way it happened. Obviously, we got beat five nil, which was, you know, never a nice thing to look back on. But you know, I was I look back on that and think that I'm lucky that I was very lucky to start my international career off in one of the hardest places to have gone and played cricket here and to be at the receiving end of, you know, a pretty sort of embarrassing tour because it, it, it allowed me to not come into it and think that international cricket is easy at any point because there was not one easy part of that tour and um, it really made me realise, you know, what international cricket is and I was, you know, I was 21 at the time so, um, you know, coming in and playing in that series is my first one, you know, I was, I look back on it and I count myself very, very lucky to have been a part of it. Guys, how how nervous are you about this Ashes t- t- tournament? Um, just just want to say, um, I don't know how much you know about this podcast, but uh, last year we did a, a motivational CD-ROM for the Harlequins team, and they actually went on to win the semi-final and the final. So I don't know if if you need that, just let us know. We can send you a, an inter- a, a motivational CD-ROM to try and get you through this Ashes. Uh, I'm glad you said they won the semi-final and the final there, because if you said they won the semi-final but not the final, it would have been pointless, no, no, wouldn't it? No, no, it's it's also Jack Knowles. We've you know we sent him one for Exeter. They also got to the final. They didn't win the final, but we're, we're sort of telling you about the Harlequin side of it. <laughs> so okay, it's a right. better so sound. It's, it's, what it's, you did, won, you covered all bases. You want to send us bases. one and Australia, and whoever wins it, you sort of did it right. Yeah, yeah. And then when we come to this kind of section of the podcast, we we tell you the, the winners. Yeah, you know, well, yeah, it's, yeah. It's the strategy. We, we haven't spoken to anyone in the Australian team, if that's what you're thinking, yet. <laughs> um, guys, going back to forecast, I noticed that you lads have signed some professional streamers. How did that come about, and what are the plans for the business going forward? So, the, the streamers came about, there was a very long process, actually, in terms of the route that we wanted to go down with the people that we wanted to bring on initially. And <laughs> we... We also want to be able to offer guys in the e because esports is a very, very strange sort of yeah business at the moment. There's not a lot of structure to, to it. There's not a lot of help to the guys who aren't the big, big names. And you know, the big, big names, you know, uh, compared to how many people play games, it was a very, very small percentage. And you know, so we could have gone out there and gone right. Who are the biggest and who are the best right now in the UK? Right, let's go and have those conversations but we wanted to sort of earmark the guys who are up there in terms of potential and competing with the best in the world but don't necessarily have the people around them or the following or the getting the recognition so we wanted to obviously bring them in and we're not only offering them you know like a a chance to be part of an organization but we're obviously wanting to to grow them to be more than just you know like a um, like gamers, because, you know, there is another side to, to, to life than, than sitting in front of a console, because as we understand, there's more to life than just being a sportsman. Um, so if we can help these guys from a young age, we've got a guy called Lennon, who's 20, and then one of the other guys, Louis, he's, he's, he's currently 26, so he's a bit older, but, you know, they, they haven't really experienced anything else except playing video games and, you know, being very, very good at it. So we felt as if that we could offer more to them than just coming in and sort of representing them. We can offer them, you know, just a sort of quite a lot of experience in terms of you know building your not only your career but also your life away from what your job is um, because of the fact that there's like myself Stuart and and Jofra who have you know been doing our, our thing for so long but we we have other things to worry about as well. Stokesy I mean that maybe that's saying you know I, I can come in and help if they need to see you know what's more to life than playing computer games I'm happy to take them you know for an all dare and clap up. Um, show them show the sites, you know, Infernos, maybe the ship in Wandsworth, a great venue. Obviously, start with the Megans, of course, Brody. But then, you know, we could we could see the, the, the array of bra, you know, bars and, and, you know, maybe introducing some chicas out here. You know, Clapham have got some, <laughs> some phenomenal chicas from, you know, and they're all from good stock. So it'd be a good investment for them. <laughs> I'm sure they'd love that. Um, boys, we've obviously heard a lot from the England rugby lads about initiations once they've done their first cap. Does the England cricket team have a similar process? Like, what, what does one have to under, sort of undergo after their first cap for England? Nothing. Nothing. I don't. Think, no, I don't think anything. No. 
Okay. No? The England team, that's, that's... The, the rugby team, they stand up and they sing a song and then they have to have a drink from each player in the team. Um, and in, in our rugby team in Clapham, you have to do a bum funnel. Um, but I won't go into detail about that. Um, you can probably guess what that, that involves. Yeah, I was going to say, you've, you've gone into detail there by telling us what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's go back to Headingley, you know, one of the greatest days in English cricket history. How did you boys celebrate that night? And also, I really want to know, have you watched the test on Amazon Prime? Did you feel sorry for Nathan Lyon? So, we celebrate. Uh, no, I don't think we left. We, we, we stayed in the change rooms a long time, Stu. Um, and then, well, what we did, we watched it. We watched it back, didn't we? Watched that uh, last yeah. hour and a half back in the head of the change room, just in disbelief, really. Like uh, as as everyone in the country was in a bit of disbelief as, as to what had just happened. We almost had to like watch it back to make it real. Um, and we just sort of sat in the change room for hours and hours. Um, enjoying the moment to be honest that sounds a bit cheesy but very ready to get a test match win that will go down well very ready to get a test match win they're, they're always very special but one that will go down in the history of the game as one of the greatest with one of the greatest innings ever so we just sat there with the you know with the team for for a long time having a few beers um and then then we went back to the hotel and celebrated a bit with the families uh but yeah it was it was do you remember the Sunday? It was a bank holiday Sunday, like an unbelievably sunny day, just like the perfect evening after beating Australia in a test match to sit and have a few beers over, over a cricket ground. Uh, it was it was honestly one of the greatest days. The thing you missed out there is that one of the so there was about seven of us. I think we ended up getting an Uber XL back, and um, on the way back to the hotel, we we might have had a stop off at McDonald's and ordered. <laughs> I think we actually had an order of about 90 quid through McDonald's drive through before we got to the hotel. Mate, when you're on those IPL uh, contracts, that's absolutely nothing. Yeah, but I was thinking like 90, but can you think about how much McDonald's you get for 90 quid? Yeah, that is, that is awful yeah, for the, for the it, chassis. It was yeah. a lot. And unfortunately as well, that was my neighbour's wife's first ever experience at a cricket game. Oh my God. She, she's she never going to want to go back. Well, no, she thought that's what cricket was every single time you turn Yeah, out. exactly. She's always going to be disappointed. So, yeah. Um, you you guys have been yeah. doing some incredible like war zone streams. Are you going to continue doing those when you're out in Australia, or is that is that is that done for? It's so hard with the time difference. Okay. Well, but, I mean, um, Turnsy wanted us to bring uh, that up, so if you could pretend that you are going to do it, Stacey. <laughs> yeah, no, I would say it's so hard with the time difference. But you know, when when we've got time off and we've got you know you, you've got you've got a business to run still. But do you, do you ever play against the Aussie boys? Like, did they get involved in in in, in war zone? Uh, played with a few of them actually. Played with a couple of the Aussie guys, yeah. Decent not or against not? them. Yeah, yeah. Well, everyone's sort of the same. It's you get like you get the odd player who plays cricket who's sort of like you know next level. But you know we're all you know that's what Stuart says about me. He's like I'm average, so he's next level above me. But yeah, whatever. Um, but yeah, you get a lot. You get a lot of people who play it. I think Robert Sancroft Baker actually is a bit of a gamer. Again, makes you think that you'd get on really well. I'll, I'll definitely hook that up. Yeah. I'll speak to Turnsy and sort it out. Um, obviously, rivalries going into the ashes. Brody, you had Warner's number and then some. I mean, poor bloke. Everyone despises the fella, but come on. You must have felt bad for him when you just kept on taking that off stump out of him. What are your biggest rivalries? When you look at your career so far, Stokesy and Brody, who is the one player who maybe's riled you up a tiny bit or who you think's like, Jesus Christ, I don't want, want to be walking to the crease or bowling to this, this fella? For me, it's teams. Rather than one individual player, I think, you know, Australia, for me, the history of the Ashes is something that really, like, fires me up, really revs me up. So, for me, it's the rivalry between those two teams. Like, when we have a beer at the end of the series, yeah, they're a great bunch of lads and you can enjoy their company. But I just find on the field, you know, it's it's probably as competitive as you're ever going to get in at the top flight, England versus Australia. Both sets of players are hugely passionate. You know, about winning for their for their country, and there's you know there's just there's just no spe no uh, time to take a backward step. And I think that's why I really that is what what international sport is for me. It should be ultra competitive. It should mean everything to each player, um, and it just feels like England and Australia is at the absolute pinnacle for for Test match cricket for that. Whether that's because of my family history involved with the Ashes, my dad playing and stuff, I don't know. But you know, it's um, there's there's a feeling you get in your stomach when you when you walk on the field with an Eng England cap, 
or walk through the Laws Long Room um, when Australia are in town. It's uh, it's as good as it gets. Lexi? Yeah, there's teams, obviously, in Australia, exactly the same as Brody. It's just, there's just such a different feel. Um, India as well, I get sort of close to those emotions when we play them. Um, but in terms of player, there's only ever really been one player who I've really had a personal, like, you know. Can I guess like, this one? Yeah, it's, it's a personal battle. It's that deep that it's almost a personal battle with myself. To, to Is he from to the West like Indies? Control myself? Yes, he is. Okay. Does he like to salute? Yeah, I think he did it once, yeah. Okay. Well, do you want to tell us who it is, Brody? At a guess, a random guess, um, it would be Marlon Samuels, but that, uh, I am I am guessing that. I mean, I come mean, on. It's, he, great, he, it's, he, it's a great guess. He, he created out, drama. Out of, the, out of all the cricketers in the Caribbean and you managed to pick the right one. I mean, God. <laughs> Well, yeah. Uh, I, 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 the guest came from when you got out in Grenada and he just <laughs> you had to walk past it was just so... <laughs> That was absolutely great. Well, it wasn't going to be Rakim Cornwall, was it? I mean, Jesus Christ. He's I a big old boy. Um, when we're talking about, uh, you know, going out with the boys to celebrate when you win 5-0 in the Ashes, who is the guy who's the sort of the Finn Russell of the team, comes up in designer clothes, buys champagne, really looks after the boys? Like, like who's the guy who loves leading the charge in a night out? I can't think we've had a night out for four years after winning a game. Those days are gone. They're gone. Unfortunately, they're gone. They're gone in, in our in professional cricket. That's what happens uh, when Popey joins the, the team. <laughs> um, cool. No, Sexy, well, I mean, I you're, uh, you're we get a leader. Bit, we get a bit giddy, don't we? We get a bit giddy. The team room all of a sudden turns into a bit of a um, <clears throat> bit of a war zone. Okay. So, so yeah. Stacey, you're, you're, you're sort of guilty. And um, Brody, talking about being riled up there, let's remember last year, cricket returns after a you know, horrible time of COVID. And Stokesy, you're captain of the three lions. You're leading a charge. And then suddenly, Brody's not in the squad. We've got a riled up Brody sat on a big brother chair going on a five minute rant. But since then, Brody, let's be honest, you have been absolutely genius. So actually, was it a turn of genius by the man, Benjamin Stokes, to, to, you know, to say, Brody, we're resting you this first one, and then you're going to explode back onto the scene? <laughs> Who was Brody? the question aimed at? Well, Brody and Stokesy, really. Um, so I always look back on that, right? And I go that people ask, ask me about Brody's reaction. And I said, well, if he'd reacted any other way, then I probably would have been a little bit sort of like disappointed that you don't have a, a professional cricketer to be disappointed that they've been left out and especially someone of Stu's caliber. But one thing that I wanted to do in that situation is I wanted to be the one to tell Stewie he wasn't playing because I didn't want to be seen to be coming into the job and do it only on this once and then to shy away from the hard decisions and let the coach do it. And it was a very hard thing for me to do, but I know that if I had left it to someone else, the respect that I've got of Stuart would have all gone completely out the window and we probably wouldn't have the same type of relationship because he would have viewed that as Stokes he doesn't have the balls to come and tell me that he's leaving me out of, of this test match and um and in terms of everything that Brody said after that I couldn't have I wouldn't have been expected anything else from him because he's an elite sportsman and being left out of any sport any team is absolutely heartbreaking um do you, so, do you remember when you remember when you mentioned it to me in the team room and like I was I my body like started shaking do you remember that I was like quite emotional about it, but you know that, that's. Um, I think every sports person has moments in their in their career that that uh, can reset them, and that for me made me realise that uh, I had another gear left in me. Um, what would I have been? Thirty three, maybe thirty four. Uh, I had, a, you know, I had, uh, I had, um, you know, another level in my performance because if I'd have if so, if I'd have been told I was out the team. And I'd have been like, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, well, I'll try and get in next time. 
then I, my competitiveness is not at the level it needs to be at international sport. But when I got told, like I, my body was like shaking uncontrollably, I went back to my room. I had two or three days, obviously very, very disappointed. But as soon as that disappointment flipped into drive, then I was, I was very determined to, you know, try and perform at that top level again. And, and you know, I knew I was going to get, I, I was hopeful I was going to get another opportunity in that series. Um, and there's that saying in sport, isn't there? Like, you should always try and treat every game like it's your last, which it, it feels very hard to do until it feels quite tangible. Like, okay, wow, yeah, you know, I've, I've, you can get dropped at any time. And I think that motivated me a lot from that period. Um, and it just met, it, it actually does make you really want to enjoy each game like it could be your last because then every time you get the ball, every time you get the bat in your hand, you're like, let's perform at the top of my level. This doesn't last forever. Um, so I, probably, arguably, one of the best things that happened has happened to me in the last four or five years. Um, I, I, I actually had something very similar happen to me at school uh, when I was uh, in third form and I was, I was dropped for um, uh, another guy. I think it was to do with his parents. They knew, knew the teacher in charge. And that drive inspired me, very similar to Brody, actually. And from, I, I, I guess I'm lucky, Brody. I had that at an early age. You know, you've, you've got that slightly further down the line. But I've continued to have that drive since 13. That's probably why I'm so successful. Well, talking about being successful, Archie, as you may know, is an incredibly successful businessman who made a lot of money in Bitcoin and then lost a lot of money investing in, uh, in Biltong, as, uh, as he mentioned well, earlier. coming back up, baby. But I noticed that up. you guys have invested in CBD brand Three Dots. Uh, how's that going? And are you looking at any other investments? How do you get involved in, in a CBD brand? Uh, yeah, it's a... It's a the first one for us as a company, um, you know, putting our, you know, company name to another company, but it's been a, um, it's been a long going relationship and um, it's, yeah, it started off well, the people, the, the, the guy we've met, um, Sean, who's the, the founder of the company is a very, very enthusiastic man towards his, um, towards three dots. Uh, he's a massive believer in the product and it's one of those, those products that's almost been Frowned, frowned upon probably is the right word actually in sport because of the CBD and its association, you know, with the, as a cannabinoid and stuff like that. But um, you see a lot more sportsmen, you know, across different sports taking it, you know, from a, a recovery point of view, especially. And we we decided that, right, what we want to go into this and we want to try and help, you know, three dots goal is to is to try and get into the sports market like the other um, CBD companies are. So. Um, not only the fact that we we love the brand and the people involved in it, but we like the product and we also like their well love their business plan in terms of where they want to take it and what the meaning of three dots is to Sean the founder and the other guys involved in the company because you know they've got a real real attachment to it because the founder Sean is um, you know has a real personal touch to it because of you know personal things that he's gone through and and how he's seen the value in CBD and. Um, yeah, it's been great. So hopefully yeah. we can drive it forward. I mean, you guys will definitely do well on this podcast promoting it. Uh, we we actually had George Cruz, uh, old Snoozo, on the on the po podcast uh, promoting his CBD oil. I won't even mention it, and his banter was awful. Um, I mean, it was a, it was a it was a snooze fest, and that's why I won't bid it. But yeah. We'll put the link in the bio of the podcast. Hopefully people go and buy it and everyone makes a lot of coin. Well, we'll definitely put the link for the CBD and forecast. Guys, we've got two more questions for you. We finish off every single podcast. It's a shame. We could go on for hours. We could, it's but they've been, got to go to bed. Great. They're, they're elite sportsmen. Yeah, yeah. Um, we finish every pod where we read out 10 of your ex or current teammates and we play a game called Chat or No Chat. So we basically read out the names and you simply say if they've got chat or no chat. Um, we've had some interesting scores throughout the series. Um, so, 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 you know, so maybe we start with Stacey and then Brody follows or we start Brody, whatever. So we're going to start off with Freddie Flintoff. Yeah. So when you, sorry, just a bit more, like, has he got a good chat? Yeah, Did, just good chat. Does he have good chat or yeah. does he have no chat? Is he good fun on the night out or not? Yeah, he's good chat. Good chat. Brody? Good chat. Liam Livingston? Good chat. Good Ooh. chat. Jimmy Anderson? Um, no yes. chat. I'm gonna say no chat. No. One beer. 
loads of chat. chat. Yeah, that was yeah, that's what I was trying to get the <laughs> word out of. Um, Alistair Cook. No chat, but it's good chat when he chats. <laughs> the greatest answer of all time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ollie Pope. No chat. no chat. I'll answer it. No chat. Z- Zach Crawley. No chat. Crawley? Knows it all chat. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Johnny Bersto, Young JB. No chat. Oh, uh, interesting. I'm going to go a lot of chat. Steve Smith. Funny chat. No Funny. idea. No. No idea. You, you, he hasn't sort of taunted you when you when you get stuck. sort of you know a Yorker. Probably Let's just put him down for no chat. So. Okay. Be no chat. And then the final two: Kevin Peterson. A lot of no chat. chat. Oh, Stacey says no. Brody says a lot. And then finally, David Warner. No chat. Um, a lot of social media chat. Instagram king. He is good at Instagram. Shame he's not that great at batting in England. Guys, you've been absolutely incredible. Yep. Just to finish so I've off. Got to, I've got to say, we've had a lot of cricketers on this podcast. You know, we've had Popey. We've had Duckett. We've had Goffey. We've had, we've had Monty Panesar. Yep. And that was a, that was a strange podcast. Um, and you guys are up there with some of the best chat. You are it's absolutely incredible. thoroughly enjoyable. Thanks Go, for your time. Guys, quickly, um, forecast-wise. Let's wise, connect on LinkedIn. Let's yes, definitely please. do that. Let's definitely do that. Guys, forecast-wise. Who has LinkedIn, though? Who has LinkedIn? Stokesy, if you're going into the business world, LinkedIn is where it's at. It's the, it's uh, the Instagram of the business world. I'll, I'll set you up an account. I'll speak to Turnsy. Yeah, I'll yeah, speak to Turnsy. Speak, speak to Turnsy. <laughs> yeah, I'll speak to your fixer. I'll speak to your fixer. <laughs> Go, guys, just to finish off, how do the listeners get involved in all the incredible work you're doing with Forecast? And, you know, what can they look out for in the coming weeks? Well, I think the best way to sort of keep up to date is to, you know, we're very heavily on uh, our Instagram, um, Twitter. We find that Twitter actually is a sort of a bit of a dead zone at the moment. But the more we've gone into gaming, it's a very, very popular space in the gaming world. Um, so we're trying to be a bit more active on it. We've got our, we've got a YouTube channel, which we've been doing, you know, quite a lot of work on to, to start producing some content. So we'll have quite a lot coming um coming over the next couple of months but um obviously me and Stuart are currently out in Australia doing our um daily jobs so we're obviously very heavily concentrating on that at the moment but we'll be trying our best to keep up to date with both things and final word in the ashes we got it coming we can't wait sad BT Sport have it rather than Sky but we can't do anything about that um what do you think is going to happen can we do it well I mean you know it's the same question you know <laughs> do you reckon anyone who's got asked do you think you can win have said no I don't think so no, well, I don't know. Maybe England, you, England you, in the nineties. If you did say that, it'd be a great scoop for us on this podcast, <laughs> wouldn't it? Do you know, like Brody, back me up on this, right? So, when we go away and we get the touring fans, you know, the Barmy Army, they're absolutely great support. But you get sometimes where they're not quite sure what to say to you if they don't know yet, and they go, "We're going to win today, lads." I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> like, <laughs> are you confident? Well, yeah. To be honest, I. Molly doesn't know cricket that much. After day one of a test match, which are five days, she, when I walk home, she'll go, did you win? Oh, God. No, we're, we're, we're one day in. We've still got four to go, <laughs> don't worry. Is it, well, uh, my, my view on the Ashes is if we need to win day one at Brisbane and no, look no further. If we win day one at Brisbane, we stand a brilliant chance. If we win at the Gabba day one, we're on top and we're going to bring it home. Lads, you've been absolutely incredible. Send our love to your Guys. messages. Love and champagne. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been it's been monumental. It's been a great business meeting. Turnsy, I definitely owe you a birria at the Ned ASAP. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, and good luck uh, this winter. Thanks, guys. Thanks, boys. Cheers, Cheers mate. Really Thanks a lot. Thank you very Cheers, much. Mate. Thank you.